The reason I pick these two examples to illustrate this calculation is this. If we look at the amount of the solid of each of these that dissolves, there's a different amount. So don't think that the KSP will tell us a particular amount of grams or a particular amount of moles that are going to dissolve in a particular solution. KSP is just a measure of how we can look at the equilibrium constant of a saturated solution. So when we're looking at these things, we can come up with the following statement. We can say that KSP and molar solubility are directly related when the cation to anion ratio is the same. But since the ice tables are different with different ratios of cation to anion, some extra thought is required when comparing KSP and molar solubility. And I think this statement right here that I just said is best illustrated by performing an example. So the example problem that we can ask is which of the following slightly soluble salts has the largest molar solubility. And we're going to compare five of them. The five salts that we're going to look at are cadmium carbonate, cadmium hydroxide, cobalt hydroxide, silver iodide, and zinc carbonate. If we have these five salts, this question is impossible unless we have the KSP values. There's one of two ways that you'll get KSPs. One, they'll be mentioned right in the problem, or two, we'll give you a KSP table attached to the end of your exam. So for the KSP values, for cadmium carbonate, the KSP is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 12. For cadmium hydroxide, the KSP is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14. For cobalt hydroxide, it's 2.5 times 10 to the minus 15. For silver iodide, it's 8.3 times 10 to the minus 17. And for zinc carbonate, it's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11. So here are our five values for the KSP. I will say one thing, and you're going to find this out when you write your lab report and put it together for the KSP of calcium iodate. In the discussion section, the instructions ask you to look up a literature value for the KSP of calcium iodate. This seems fairly straightforward, so we're going to go to our favorite reference source, which is Google. We're going to type in KSP calcium iodate, we're going to hit enter, and you're going to come up with millions of hits of all types of web pages that has a KSP value for calcium iodate. You're going to click on the first web page, you're going to find a value, you're going to write it down, and everybody's going to be happy, right? But some of you might be curious. You're like, okay, what if I click on the second web page? And you look at it, and there's a different value. And you're like, okay, well, which one's right? So that means we're going to go to the third web page on there and click on it, and yet it's another value. KSP values, look at these things, look at the silver iodate up there, or silver iodide. 8.3 times 10 to the minus 17. That's a pretty small number. How easy do you think it is to measure that? It's tough. 8.3 times 10 to the minus 17, you know how small that freaking value is? So you're going to go through and you're going to see different sites. Depending on when the data was collected, the KSP values may fluctuate. Even if you look in one textbook to another textbook, the values will change. The reason I'm bringing this up is because you guys are using a computer program that grades the problems based on the KSP that it has inputted into the system. So I'm going to throw out a warning and a disclaimer that if you need a KSP value in an online problem and it's not there, don't Google something and look it up and use the first value that you find. Please email me right away and let me know that I need to post the KSP value for that problem. Okay? We ran into trouble with this last quarter in Chemistry 122, and to my knowledge, all of the quiz questions that are graded on the KSP assignment have the KSPs actually typed into the problem. I had to go through and manually insert a couple of those. So if you're doing a quiz problem and you see these KSP values, or you need a KSP value, please email me so I can post that up there. Okay? But KSPs are a little tricky, right? And they're tough to determine. And you're going to try to figure this out in that first experiment. So in your first lab experiment, rather than grade you based on how accurately you can calculate this value right here that might be argued in different scientific communities by experts, I want you to pick or find a website. Number one, you have to list your source because the sources are going to vary. 
Okay, make sure when you write your discussion that you have a little footnote with the reference that you use where you got your KSP. And what I want you to do is say, why is my KSP value different than what they state in the literature? What could have went wrong in a particular experiment to make it either too high or make it too low? And explain why. And I think that's a better learning experience than just saying, hey, minus 10 points for not getting the KSP out to eight decimal places. Okay? So think about that when you're going through and you're writing your report together. Back to this example problem. Sorry for the little sidebar there. But we have a list of KSPs and we want to know which one has the largest molar solubility. This is probably one of the favorite standardized test questions that you'll see, both from the American Chemical Society, from an MCAT, from a DAT, from a GR. I don't know if they had this on the GRE, but this is what a question that they really, really like, because if, if you're not thinking, you'll pick the wrong answer. Okay? So step number one for this problem right here is we're going to group this, the salts based on cation to the anion ratio. So we're going to put these particular five salts into two groups. There's a group that I'm going to call AB and a group that I'm going to call AB2. The AB group is going to be the cadmium carbonate, silver iodide, and zinc carbonate. The AB2 group is cadmium hydroxide and cobalt hydroxide. So the reason that I put these two into these different groups is for the following. If we look at the ice tables for a compound that has a stoichiometry AB as a solid, it's in equilibrium with A plus in aqueous solution plus B minus also in aqueous solution. These could also be 2 plus and 2 minus, 3 plus 3 minus, 4 plus 4 minus. We know that the charge of the cation and the anion is going to be the same, and it's going to be in equilibrium with its salt. If we set up an ice table, the solids don't show up in the equilibrium expression. If we have an initial concentration of 0 and we dissolve x moles of this solid, that means the change in concentration for the A plus is going to be plus x, for the B minus is going to be plus x, and our equilibrium concentration of each of those is going to be x. The KSP for this expression is going to be the concentration of A plus at equilibrium times the concentration of B minus at equilibrium. So our KSP is going to be equal to x squared. And I should say that this is assuming x moles of solid dissolves in one liter of solution. So if we say that we have this solid, we're going to dump it into an aqueous solution and x moles of that are going to dissolve. That means the KSP is going to be, or x moles of it are going to dissolve per liter, that means the KSP is going to be equal to x squared. And that means, and we can set up these ice tables and everything that has the same one-to-one -one cation to anion ratio is going to give us the same KSP expression. This is why we can group them based on this. Now if, for instance, we have a compound in the second group that is AB2 as a solid, that's going to be in equilibrium with A2 plus in aqueous solution plus 2B minus, also in aqueous solution. If we set up our ice tables to determine the equilibrium concentration of our ions in solution, again, the solid does not have an effect. Our initial concentrations are going to be zero. We dump the solid into the solution. If x moles of that solid dissolve, we get a change in concentration of plus x for the cation and plus 2x for the anion. That means at equilibrium, our concentration is going to be x for the cation and 2x for our anion concentration. So our KSP is going to be equal to the concentration of A2 plus times the concentration of B minus that quantity squared. If we plug in our equilibrium concentrations of x and 2x, we get a KSP expression that's going to be equal to 4x to the third. The main thing that I want to point out here is when we look at our KSP expressions, this 4x to the third and this x squared right here are different. So when we go and look at this, if we assume x moles of solid dissolves, the molar solubility is equal to x. So we're trying to solve for x in this particular case. When we're solving for x and we're looking at our KSP expressions, we're going to get a different value of x if we use x squared versus 4x to the third. So what we need to do is look at our two groups, and we can rank them in solubility right away for group number one and group number two. So based on looking at the KSP, we can make two conclusions. Conclusion number one is that zinc carbonate, or ZnCO3, 
is going to have a greater solubility than cadmium carbonate, which is going to have a greater solubility than silver iodide. And if we scroll back over here to the KSP values, we can look and we can directly compare the cadmium carbonate, we can directly compare the silver iodide, and we can directly compare the zinc carbonate just by looking at those KSP values. We can also directly compare cadmium hydroxide and cobalt hydroxide. So at the end of the day, we can know just by looking at the KSPs, we can narrow it down to two particular um, compounds that we will have to do calculations with. So based on just looking at the KSP, the zinc carbonate solubility is going to be greater than the, the cadmium carbonate, which is going to be greater than the silver iodide. We also know that the, by looking at the KSP that the cadmium hydroxide is going to have a greater molar solubility than the cobalt hydroxide. In terms of comparing these two groups, a calculation must be performed. So we need to do some type of calculation in order to determine our molar solubility right here. So we can go ahead and do that. So we know that for zinc carbonate, our KSP is going to equal the concentration of zinc 2 plus times the concentration of the CO3 2 minus. We have a one-to-one -one cation to anion ratio, so we know that our KSP that we saw up here is going to be equal to x squared. The listed KSP is going to be 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11. So our x squared is going to be 1.4 times 10 to the minus 11, and our x is going to equal 3.7 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. This value for x is the molar solubility of zinc carbonate in an aqueous solution. So we can't just look at the KSP and determine that. We have to think a little bit and do a calculation. One of the things that I hope you picked up at the very end of chapter 16 and 17 is that when you're doing these ice tables, the more problems you do over and over and over and over again, you might not have to write out the entire ice table like that. If you see a one-to-one -one cation to anion ratio, you should know that at equilibrium, if we're just in aqueous solution, we're going to get a value of x squared. If you see a one-to-two cation to anion ratio, we know that our KSP in this case is going to be 4x to the third. So we can also come back here and look at the KSP um, for cadmium hydroxide. It's going to be the concentration of cadmium 2 plus times the concentration of OH minus, that quantity squared. And from what we showed earlier right here, that's going to be equal to 4x to the third. Our 4x to the third value, if we plug in the given KSP, it's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14th. And that's going to tell us that x is going to equal 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So now we're able to compare this value right here to this value right here. And we can directly compare them. So we now have the molar solubility of each of these complexes. We can come over here and write that 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 molar is greater than 3.7 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. And the conclusion then that we can finally draw from all of this is that CdOH twice, or cadmium hydroxide, has the largest molar solubility. Okay? Does anyone have any questions on this entire procedure right here? And one of the things that I want to point out is that if we look back here, this question looks oh so innocent, right? Which of the following has the largest molar solubility? I give you five complexes and five KSPs. The innocent thing to say and the naive thing to say is that, oh, I'm just going to rank them in order of KSP, and that's probably going to be the right answer. I guarantee you that's going to be probably option A or B on a multiple choice exam, okay? But yes, that might be a trick question, right? But what I want you guys to do is I want you to think these problems through, and I want you to think about what's going on and analyze all the facts that we have at hand. If, if we come back, I mean, there's a lot going on here, and you need to do the practice problems for this stuff so you can think about these things kind of like the back of your hands. Okay. One of the things that I want to briefly mention um, right now is we're going to look at, or at least it looks like the bell's going to ring here fairly soon. We're going to look at, when we start class on Friday, criteria for a particular precipitate to happen. So for example, we have this barium chromate. And if we mix two solutions together, will a precipitate form? The example I'll give is if we have sodium chloride. A lot of us know that table salt will dissolve when you put it in water. 
there's a certain saturation point that we can meet. Okay? So when I mix two solutions together of sodium and chloride, will a precipitate form? When I mix two solutions together of zinc and carbonate, when will the precipitate start to form? And we're going to compare the KSP versus the Q, and we'll start with that on Friday. Uh, Dr. Bruce, 